Hello and welcome to the latest installment of the Blanca Rosenstiel Lecture Series on Poland, Polish Haitian Entanglements, brought to you by the European and Eurasian Studies Program at Florida International University's Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. I'm David Kramer, the director for the European and Eurasian Studies Program at FIU's Green School, and also a senior fellow in the Václav Havel Program on Human Rights and Diplomacy. Our co-sponsors for today's event are the Miami, Florida Jean Monnet Center of Excellence, the American Institute for Polish Culture, the Honorary Consulate of the Republic of Poland in Miami, and the African and Africa, African Diaspora Studies Program uh, at FIU's Green School. This lecture series, of course, would not be possible without the generous support of Lady Blanca, to whom we are most grateful. And the American Institute for Polish Culture, with whom we work closely, will be celebrating its 50th anniversary next year, and we congratulate them on that. And they will be marking the occasion with their annual Polonaise Ball, which will take place uh, on February 12th of next year. Now, you might not often think of Poland and Haiti in the same context, but today's webinar will explain why you should and why there is much to explore in the transnational connections between Poland and the global south with Haiti in particular. The historical background that underpins this investigation begins with Napoleon Bonaparte in 1802. From 1802 to 1805, Napoleon dispatched about 5,000 Polish legionnaires to what is modern day Haiti as part of his massive effort to contain the slave rebellion that had arisen in 1791. However, a group of Polish soldiers opposed Napoleon's efforts to subjugate the rebels. Consequently, these soldiers unwittingly took part in the creation of the world's first Black-led republic and first independent Caribbean state when it cast off French colonial control and slavery in the early 19th century. We have the perfect duel of guest speakers to walk us through this fascinating history and story. Dr. Jacek Kalashinsky is founding director of the Ratcliffe Incubator of Art and Design in the FIU College of Communication, Architecture, and the Arts, an associate professor of art in the Department of Art and Art History, where he served as the department chair for six years. A visual artist and curator, Dr. Kolaszynski came to the US from Poland, where he studied history and philosophy at the Jagiellon uh, University in Krakow. Uh, his ongoing Creole Archive project explores transnational connections between Poland and the global south. Also joining us, is Edouard Duval Carrier, a contemporary artist and curator based here in Miami, Florida. Born and raised in Haiti, Duval Carrier fled the regime of pa Papa Doc Duvalier as a teenager and subsequently resided in locales as diverse as Puerto Rico, New York, Montreal, Paris, and Miami. Parallels thus emerge between the artist's cosmopolitan lifestyle and his artistic sensitivity to the multifaceted identities that form his native Haiti including the dense iconography derived from Caribbean history, politics, and religion. So with that, gentlemen, if I may, let me turn it over to you. Perhaps, Jacek, we can start with you. Thank you so much for, for this uh, gracious introduction. And uh, it's really my pleasure to, to speak about Polish and Haitian entanglements. And my conversation with uh, Edward started maybe 20 years ago, I think. Uh, when I arrived to, to Miami in 1991, I think I discovered something and I'll try to show a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation to kind of contextualize some of, of the stuff we're going to speak about. And we'll run it as a dialogue. So, so let's just get started here. Can everybody see the screen? I'm not sure, but it sounds not like- yet. Yes. Not, not yet. Not yet? Okay, well, let's try yeah. again. Technical difficulties always kind of uh, trepidate us here when we play with uh, Zoom lectures. But uh, again, we're so so happy to have Edward. And Edward Edward is traveling and doing things a lot. So I think when I called him a couple of weeks ago, he was in Kentucky, and so he says, "Yes, I'll be over there to talk, and I'll, I'm ready to talk about Polish Haitian yes histories." Okay, so please tell me if this is happening right now. Anything? Uh, we just have the title here. Okay, perfect. So let's start with this. So Article 12 of the Haitian Constitution uh, proclaimed by Dizaline in 1805 
essentially granted Polish soldiers citizenship of Haiti. And, uh, and again, after, after the brutal war of independence, uh, those, those Polish soldiers who defected Napoleon, they somewhat disappeared out of the scope of the, of the historical narrative in Poland uh, for many reasons. I think you know, Poles who returned to Haiti all, all, always wanted to have the support of Napoleon to fight for the Polish independence, the dead narrative of Polish deserters who joined rebellion and fought on the side of Haiti uh, was somewhat not a convenient one. So Edward, you, you talked to me about your early kind of contact with the Polish Haitian vestiges over there when, when you were a very young man, you discover a village somewhere, right? Yes, indeed. I, I bought a uh... Uh, I bought a property in the south of Haiti on the top of the uh, chain that goes there. And uh, one day I decided to walk, I mean, and take a long walk uh, in, the, in the area to, I mean, to really get a custom, I, I, I mean, a custom with it and find out what was going on up there. And uh, I happened on the small village which is, uh, a, I mean, probably there is, a, I mean, it's, it's, it's at the top of the mountain and below the mountain, there is a, another area that is, that is f formerly, I mean, it's called Fond des Blancs. Fond des Blancs was, you know, like, I mean, a place where people uh, usually assume that the Polish people were. But what was interesting about that village near me was the fact that the houses, you know, like looked at as if transplanted from Poland. They had like window sills with little flower, you know, like uh, what do you call them? I mean, a flower pot, you know, like near the, uh, under each window with colorful flowers. I, it was like really walking into Poland up there. And uh, I knew the, the story about the Polish uh, reversal during the, the, the Haitian um, Revolutionary War. Um, but not very deeply in, but I, I mean, that was the first time I, I witnessed, you know, like something really of that nature existing in Haiti. I mean, they mentioned Casal, they mentioned, but I've been to Casal. I mean, yes, yeah, um, it's, there was more of Poland in that little village up in the mountain than anywhere else in Haiti. And, um, as a consequence, you know, I became very interested in that, and indeed, I married to to a, a British Polish. Uh, my wife is British Polish, and when I told her that story, I mean, she went and really researched it properly, more more so than I. Maybe you should interview her. <laughs> She's very uh, keen on that particular story. Um, right. What I knew, what I inter what interested me. Also, I mean, apart, yes, there is a historical, which you know, like everybody should be involved, you know, like, or, you know, like that are, they are researching it or they are, there is research done to that. Me, what really interested me is the virgin that you have right behind you uh, in, your, in, in the wall there. And it's, uh, um, it's, it's not literally the, 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 the virgin of Chestostova, has been adopted by by Haitians in the in their what do you call it in in their iconic you know like way in an iconic way where she's she's represented as uh, as Julie Danto. Julie yeah. So, yeah. so maybe maybe let's let's kind of focus on a couple of those images that I kind of threw here in the in the presentation. So Polish soldiers being pious Catholics. In the Revolution of French Army, they brought those images. So they had them displayed on on you know little. Um, Amulets. Pendants or amulets or however you would call them. And uh, what helps us to kind of date this image is that the images that you can find in Haiti, they represent the color scheme of the images that were produced in Poland in the 17, late 1700s, because they're ex exchangeable skirts on the painting that are applied over there. And uh, this image is so important to the Polish national identity formation. And when we go back now, as Edward said, to the Haitian history, we have a night of Wakaiman, where the group of Haitian slaves who start the revolution, they evoke El Zodi Dantor as a deity, a Petroloa. So Petroloa in the voodoo uh, pantheon, it's a very important deity that uh, is a mother that supports her children, that's a mother who fights for her children's rights. And her face is adorned with the scarification patterns, very similar to those that everybody in Poland would recognize as the patterns on the Virgin Mary of Chastehova image. So, indeed, Edward, and let me take from it, here. 
I don't know the history of it. I know that uh, it, that particular history is very clear uh, in the minds of Poles, but I don't know how it happened in Haiti. I mean, you claim that, yes, they were wearing these uh, amulets that probably had that, you know, as a protective uh, uh, icon, you know, like that, uh, that they used everywhere. Anyways, in the, in the lores about in Haiti is when they saw that, they, as they assumed immediately that, this, that these uh, uh, police soldiers were affiliated with Erzuli Dator because they had started using, and they started using it immediately as the, you know, like, like uh, uh, as the, uh, as the um, in, in a syncretic way, the, 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 <coughs> the visions of the, of that, of that virgin, you know, I mean, because nobody could understand why for a long time, why this particular image were very similar, you understand? And uh, he, the only reason, I mean, I can claim is that these soldiers probably came to Haiti with it. And when they joined the, the, and the in the laws and probably in the reality, they switched sides and the, 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 the revolutionary army, the, you know, like uh, the, like people like Dessaline and others, I mean, really appreciated it because probably they came with arms and more probably more knowledge than the slaves could, you know, like muster in this in this uh, uh, in this conflict. So, so it's interesting soldiers. that you know, like that, it was adopted. Excuse mm -hmm. me. Suppose so post soldiers who ended up in Haiti were veterans of the of the long Italian campaign. They served the French Revolution for a long time. They were in the. King in, they were in Lombardia at the time, so uh, about 5,000 of them were sent from Livorno to, to Haiti, to San Domingue at the time. And uh, again, they were people who, who were deceived by Napoleon. They were people who uh, wanted to fight for the freedom of their own country, and they were sent on the, on the kind of colonial assignment that really, in their mind, was something that was a big betrayal. But at the same time, they still hoped that fighting for Napoleon would open possibilities for them to fight for the freedom of their own country. So out of 5,000 of those soldiers, uh, it's uh, probably safe to say that 500 of them stayed in Haiti initially. Uh, they were granted Haitian citizenship and some of them, about 160 went back uh, first via Jamaica, but then eventually came back uh, to Haiti and went back to, to states. And from the United States, they went back to Europe as Haitian citizen. So what as, a uh, story. <laughs> yeah, as you said, Edward, it's also very important to say that in the climate of the of the kind of change of political regime in Haiti at the time, with Dizeline being in, in the helm of the power, he creates out of the Polish soldiers his bodyguards. So he has his soldiers who are assigned to him as his guards, and they are the Polish legionaries. So he trusted them quite a bit and rewarded them with the constitutional act where they could actually possess land in Haiti. Well, I mean, according, I mean, from what we saw at the, the, the first image was, you know, like the, the, the clauses of the constitution claiming that no whites could be, but there was a particular clause concerning the Polish uh, soldiers, which is quite an amazing fact, you know, and uh, from my understanding, it is not even revoked, you know, like 200 years later, it's still part of the, the constitution of Haiti. And every time they change it, they keep, they keep it. I guess they must they must have a fond memories of those uh, of those soldiers that that joined you know like the fight. But I mean, I, I what I mean the, the situation also in Haiti. I mean, with the arrival of Napoleon during a very short period, probably ten years, the revolutionary government in, in France, which were you know like po, you know like had this the slave problem right in front of them, and they were tentatively trying to. Uh, I mean, to abolish slavery on the island and on all the, 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 the domains of France. And uh, Napoleon, which rose amongst their ranks of that revolution, realized that, that, a, uh, that he could not control the, the situation in, in, in uh, uh, I mean, like his uh, campaigns for liberté, égalité, fraternité, all over without the support of, you know, like slave labor in Haiti. And he decided to return, you know, like to, put, to reverse all of these, uh, uh, all of these uh, advancements, you know, like during the, the revolution concerning the slaves, you know, like and put them aside and, you know, like in, the story goes even more, it becomes more complicated as well when to, to, pro, to promote or to do this expedition to Haiti, 
to reinstall slavery, because that's literally what he was trying to do. Um, it involved also the sale of the Louisianas. I mean, Napoleon, you know, like preferred to, you know, like give away or sell the Louisianas to, re, I mean, to um, get his coffers back to, you know, like to activity. Uh, and so they could finance, you know, like his, his follies. And the biggest of his follies was to try to put back the slaves into, in, on the plantations in Haiti. So, so going back to, to what you said, like, you know, the, the position of Saint-Domingue at the time, it was, it was the crown jewel of the, of the sugar production from France. And yes. with all the revol revolutionary edicts, all of a sudden, this country possibly goes its, its own way with, uh, again, uh, Toussaint Louverture being at the helm first, like, you know, he creates provisions and he doesn't really want to be disattached from, from France. He still believes that he's a, a general de république and uh, he wants to stay attached. But Napoleon essentially using the, the moment where there's a peace between Britain and France sends his troops to really bring his order and then reorganize uh, Saint-Domingue as a, as a proper colony that would serve his, his uh, needs. And again, the Poles are being uh, considered even to be sent at some point to Louisiana, but uh, essentially those units end up in Saint-Domingue. And uh, I think somewhere during the presentation, I was going back to, to this, this man here. So General Władysław Jabłonowski is a, is a Polish uh, general who was of the African descendants in his mother, um, I had a child with a, with a with a man of the of the African descendancy, and then he was adopted by General by, by his father Yabunovsky as a prince. He went to school with Napoleon, and he sent to Haiti with the first contingency of the military as a general of uh, General de République, and uh, he dies quickly after in 1802 in Jeremy out of yellow fever. So yellow fever was something what really decimated the troops who arrived in Haiti. Yes, indeed. They, I mean, they were confronted with that issue, but apparently they, they, they uh, from what I've read and from what I understand as well, they were, they, they, they tried every way to, to, to uh, dissuade the, the slaves, you know, like in, into really going into a front, front, frontal assault by putting, I mean, dropping dead people in the rivers as well. So, I mean, like they were not only trying to, to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, eliminated the, the slaves, but at the same time, they eliminated themselves because they were the ones, they were the culprits in, in that particular story. But, you know, like the, 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 the rebellion in Haiti was, uh, I mean, there was no way after, I mean, tasting, I mean, I mean even a few moments, you know, like of, of liberty that the French provided them and also the papers you know, like the, the, the legal papers of, of emancipation that were edicted in Haiti, uh, it, it was too, too, too um, violent uh, a change again uh, for the Haitians uh, concerning, you know, like the, the, whatever was happening in the metropole, in the metropole in, in Paris, you know, I mean, and the, 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 the fact that they needed the, 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 the anyways, it's, it's a very complicated history. But in the end, uh, it was uh, quite a tragic ending to for for the uh, for the French, you know, like in, in the end, you know, like the revolution in Haiti succeeded, and to be to create the, the first black republic in the world. Um, all of these complications, you know, like and and to have like little histories. It's not a little history for the Haitians because they do. I mean, remember that that the uh, volte fast. I mean, that change of directions of the the. the the police soldiers. I don't know exactly. I mean, I don't know if they've made the study where, where, and when they changed camps, and in, the, in what campaign did they change it. I don't know those details. I don't know if they, those were ever recorded anywhere, anywhere in, in particular. But it just that in it seems that in the lore of the nation, these 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 white men changed because they felt betrayed as well by Napoleon, because you know, like they were sent for to sell the idea of fraternité and liberté, égalité, fraternité. And here they were trying to put back, back into slavery, black men. So, I mean, they revolted against that because that was not the campaign. The, the Napoleon campaign was truly to liberate, you know, like Europe of its royalties and, and that kind of a system. But when, you know, like they saw that he was re reverting, you know, like the whole thing by wanting to put back into slavery black men, I mean, they revolted as well. 
because that was not so, their aim. So I think uh, you're bringing a very kind of important point here in a conversation where did that shift happen, where the Polish soldiers essentially decided to, to drop the French banner and uh, fight on the side of the, of the Haitian revolutionaries. So there is, uh, there's an instance, uh, uh, it's a massacre of St. Mark. So um, different historiographies present this fact differently. And to, on the Haitian side, the writing talks about Polish soldiers being ordered by French uh, uh, generals to essentially pull out out of the ranks uh, black soldiers out of French army and essentially bayonet them down. And uh, the historiography from Haiti uh, proclaims that Polish soldiers disobeyed that order and marched out of the city. And uh, mm. it's treated by, by different accounts differently, but uh, again, the writing that appeared in Poland after the return of the soldiers to, <laughs> to, to um, uh, Europe they didn't really want to emphasize on the Polish rebellion against Napoleon and uh, Polish desertion. So that fact was a little bit kind of pushed to the side. But like I said, again, the Haitian historiography proclaims that that was the changing point for, for Polish troops and also for their acceptance by Dizdelin as brothers in arms who kind of fall on the Haitian side. It's, Maybe, it's, it's a fascinating story. But as Maybe you can see, segue. it's like hearsay up, the, up till now. There's so many different versions of it. But one thing that I know that is certain is that somehow the Virgin of Chestostova is now has become the mother goddess in the voodoo pantheon, vis at least visually. So, you know, like the marks were reminiscent of, you know, like more like Senegalese and other, you know, like type, I mean, Scarification is very prevalent in Africa to designate ethnic appartenance. And uh, so, I mean, like to see a virgin, but apparently, I mean, I've asked, you know, like where these scarifications came from, but apparently that virgin is black because, I mean, she got burnt. I mean, the, the, the church where this, the, the image was, you know, like originally from had burnt and turned this, this uh, a probably white virgin, you know, like in, into a chard kind of uh, vision of things, which was maintained and, and adopted by the, by the Poles. And when they reached the Haiti, you know, like the Haitians have thought, you know, like these were, you know, like uh, uh, adepts or, you know, like respected the, the, the mother uh, goddess of, you know, like in the voodoo pantheon, you know? So, so it's, it's to, I mean, it's very, very particular history. To maybe shed some light on the on the on the scarification. So the image of Częstochowa is an Odigritia type icon that came to Poland from uh, some historians claim Byzantium. Some claim that even the painting was painted on the table of the Holy Family by Saint Luke, and then eventually ended up uh, through through the eastern flanks to to Poland. In 1430s, the, the heretics, the Hussites, came to the church and chopped the painting up and the scarification patterns were acquired on the on the face of the Virgin Mary uh, as uh, when they attacked the, the yeah in the attack and then and then essentially a painting was painted on the wooden blocks it might have been an encaustic painting some claim some claim that it was just a typical kind of icon done with the, with the other other forms of pigmentation but the painting is destroyed and needs to be reconstructed then the painter receives the divine message from through, through a dream that Virgin Mary does not want the scars to disappear from her face. And like you said, you know, iconographically, those images really show some kind of affinity with the scarification of the fawn royalty or, or other people in, in Africa who essentially have those scar adornments. Um, the color of the face, I mean, a lot of theories, again, the painting might have been charted with uh, fire or with the candlelight or it was just painted as a as an icon that might have had some kind of Syrian or or whatever impact uh, within the kind of know, iconographic system but definitely the face is the darker face so it found a very very prominent ground as a response among the African slaves who were in Haiti because the image was very familiar right it was a woman of prominence with scarred face who could exhume some, some position within the language of, of the people who were really seeing her and venerating her. So maybe, maybe a little bit more about the uh, Elzo de Dantor role in a kind of Haitian culture. I mean, have you, have you painted any of the, of the works uh, connected to Elzo in your work? Yeah, absolutely, many times. I unfortunately don't have it there, I mean, accessible right now. But to me, she's like the, the, the one who thinks babies, sees babies and hear babies. 
I mean, she's always represented with, with uh, Jesus, uh, uh, um, uh, holding Jesus. So, I mean, that, that image is very important to, to, to it, not only in the voodoo, but it's also, you know, like a, a virgin that is revered. I mean, it's not the, really the, the Vierge du Perpetuel Secours, uh, but I mean, this, um, I mean, these images have uh, uh, been in circulation in Haiti for a long, long, long time. And uh, I mean, it's interesting that Poland has to do with it, you know, like that the Catholic Church has to do with it. But it's been the case of so many different, uh, um, how would I say, uh, can canonical uh, images that have been used in the Voodoo religion, you know, like uh, as, you know, like supplanting. I mean, and uh, they, they were, for example, Saint, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, the one with the serpent, Saint Peter is, you know, like Agwe, he, oh no, Dambala, I'm sorry. He's, he, Dambala, he, yeah. Dambala, because he, he's like, you know, he has a, uh, his foot over a, a serpent. And all of them were, uh, all of these images that were used, you know, like by the, 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 were reverted into, you know, like use as well, because you were not allowed also during slavery, you know, like to be practicing or to be following your own thing. So whatever images that were created by the slave and so that were immediately destroyed. So, you know, like by using, you know, like the, the image, the Catholic images, maybe they, they tried to pass, you know, like these, these gods, you know, like, uh, I mean, to create, I mean, like not, not to create awareness of what they were doing. Um, it's, a, it's some form of syncretism where, you know, like images were used, you know, like by one and seen otherwise by others. Uh, it's been a very common thing during slavery times, you know, the, you know, like for religious purposes, because I mean, they were supposed to be blank slates uh, when they arrived. I mean, and they, 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 they baptized them, you know, like, uh, it, because if you were not baptized, you were a bosal, you know, like you were a, a savage or something like that. Um, it's, 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 I mean, all of these histories, I'm glad that we're talking about that one because they mean it's part of, you know, like black history and, you know, like meeting points with Europe and, and because all of these things have been literally erased. I mean, they are existent because, you know, like the people of Haiti believe in, in these images, I've used them and stuff like that. But for the, you know, like for the Catholic church, they, they, they I mean, it's of no interest to them, this kind of, you know, like uh, reuse of those images, because, you know, like, um, anyways, it, it's, I find it very interesting that, you know, I'm like, showing and, right and now, also, Edward. It, yes. Yeah, I'm showing right now some murals from Miami that some of them already are gone, they disappeared to the gentrification process of the city. So the central image really started my interest uh, that is uh, something uh, what, what you could discover at the former Top Top restaurant. And uh, when I came in to Miami in 1991, there was a Top Top track, which uh, for a lot of us is a kind of familiar structure. It's a, it's a transportation vehicle in Haiti, but uh, it was sort of an adornment advertising restaurant. And on the side of the track, there was a very image of Verzoli Dantel. And, uh, I was very curious, like, you know, why is this image that bears so much familiarity to Virgin of Częstochowa as painted on the truck? And then my research sort of started at that point. And uh, again, several years later, like, you know, I kind of amass a large archive of the images that may not exist anymore. So the image to, to your very right, it's on the Botanica uh, that uh, disappeared in Haiti, doesn't exist anymore. And uh, again, we still have an image uh, representing the LZD Virgin Mary. Uh, on the on the side of the building. So I, I have to ask you, all these images that you have here were like photographed in Miami. Correct, yes. Oh, how interesting. Well, I have to look for, out for them because they crop up, you know, like in different places, in different new businesses, because I mean, Haitians are very, very devo devoted to, to, to uh, Erzulis, uh, all the Erzulis, because there are three of them. The other one is... Uh, the the, uh, the one that represents Azuli Freda, which is more about, you know, like, I mean, womanhood and, you know, like uh, procreation and love and all of this. She's like the goddess of love, Azuli Freda. Meanwhile, this one, and there's another one, uh, which is, you know, like more of a, a more like a, like a, a, like something from out of Mexico because she sees a skeleton 
Her name is Marinette Boachesh, and she's the third Ezri. She's the grandmother. She's the one that's about to die. And she's the most potent one because she's the one that, you know, like that creates the rules, you know, like when, uh, and also, you know, like he's, he's promoting, um, you know, like the, 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 the righteousness, you understand? I mean, they, they call unto her to be a judge. They call unto her to, 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 to settle certain matters. Anyways, I mean, so there are three heirs of these, and probably there are more because, you know, like, I mean, in, in Haiti, the whole thing was that all these tribes had to, they came from all over. The French came very late in this, you know, like appropriation of certain, you know, like ethnicities like the United States or the British, you know, like uh, they, they had to go all over to, to, to buy slaves because, I mean, their industry of sugar required, you know, like a replenishment, a constant replenishment of work because the work was so hard uh, on those plantations and so rigorous because really the French had, I mean, turned that, that industry, not as an agrarian thing, but more of as, as an agribusiness in the sense that I mean, they needed that sugar, they controlled it internationally. And uh, um, just like much like petrol is today, I mean, like certain, and they, they want, I mean, and they, I mean, some people say that, you know, like France did uh, it, its uh, industrial revolution much earlier than the British, but unfortunately for them, you know, like they did it on the back of, uh, and on the sweat of uh, black slaves. So um, anyways, these so, are, these are, Going back to, to something what you just mentioned that I think it's an interesting thought that you kind of see Erzuli as a deity or a trinity of deities representing women at different stages of their life from, from a young woman to a mature woman, the defender of her family to, to the wise older grandmother who kind of guides her community. And I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of very beautiful symbol to kind of uh, transmit that image that has such a transnational journey to, to kind of uh, encapsulate uh, their kind of powerful Womanhood. position for women. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's fascinating. But, I've uh, always been very fascinated by that, by that image. And uh, uh, it, it is important, you know, I mean, the, and this is, this is a really beautiful story as well, you know, I mean, like to, to make people realize that, you know, like not everybody was like a, a Napoleon, you know, like a apologist, you know, that, that the, the, the Napoleon was, you know, like very controversial figure. I mean, even though, you know, like his code, uh, code uh, uh, civil and whatever are still in vigor today for French, for the French, I mean, you know, like his, uh, uh, his actions and his uh, very bellicose attitude to the rest of Europe in the guise of you know like liberating them from you know like the oppression of the of the nobility and stuff like that i mean were quite misguided and uh, in the case of haiti it was literally you know like i mean after you know like we really discussed this thing for years you know like uh and and try to organize it in a different way he came back and really really wanted to reinstate and forcefully i mean liberated slaves back to the plantations and that was a big no-no for the for the Haitians. So um, it's a very complicated and convoluted story. But people have to be called what they you know like I mean have to be called upon. I mean Napoleon was quite a an odious figure to many people, including the Poles, even though right. many times they love him. <laughs> well, I think let's shift to another sort of entanglement of Poland and Haiti. So not that long ago, in the in the Venice Biennale, Poland. Uh, had a project that was called Halka Haiti or Haiti that represent that was created by Jasper and Joanna Marinowska and those two artists reenacted Polish national opera Halka in Kazal in the in the in the Polish village in the in the mountains over there in Haiti and then the project was recorded and taken back to Biennale as uh, again kind of re-narration of a Polish Atlantic history so so again I think it was quite of an interesting story that essentially. Polish pavilion was represented by work that brought back narratives of those of those people who were sort of forgotten by history. So was it the first time that they did that? I mean, that, they, yeah. that it was presented in a public fashion, the, this connection with Haiti, or is it? A, uh, I mean, as, is it important as in Haiti that they re, that that somehow it's like part of the lore of the nation? You know, like. It's not like that in your in, in Poland. No, I think I think we, we go back to to Polish uh, national writer Mickiewicz, who brings the story of the of the um, 
Jabonowski uh, in his uh, in his uh, uh, great uh, work over there talking about his uh, fights in Haiti, and then Jeromsky in his uh, work called Popiola, I think he uh, shows the character who is one of the deceived soldiers who fought for Napoleon and talks about the great tragedy of Paul's being cooked. So, so it functions within the concept of national sort of uh, legend that Poles went to Saint-Domingue and they fought over there and some of them stayed. But I think not a lot of that is really left as a kind of uh, narrative. So Polish theater director, Grotowski, very important in, in the kind of formation of the Polish theater, he believed that one of his ancestors, Filip Grotowski, was an officer who was sent to Saint-Domingue to fight. And he believed that he settled, or maybe some of his relatives settled in Kazal. So Grotowski goes in late 70s to Kazal and he is researching uh, sort of Polish material over there. And uh, strangely enough, he encounters over there a voodoo Ongan whose name is, um, again, um, here, Amon Fremont. And Amon Fremont claims that he's a descendant of the Polish troops. And Grotowski invites Fremont to come back to, with him to Poland. And uh, he works with him on some projects uh, connected to his uh, theater. And most recently, in 2013, I believe, two Polish uh, artists, uh, filmmakers, Konopka and Rosowowski, made this beautiful film that is called The Art of Disappearing, or in Polish language, Sztuka Znikania, that creates this uh, documentary-like uh, film of the reflections of Amon Fremont, who comes to Poland to help Polish people to mitigate the ailments of communism and chase it out using his connection to the Loas. And it's, it's a beautiful story. Wow. The story ends up that Fremont returns to Haiti and he loses his contact with Loas as a, as a gift given to the Polish nation to, to really chase the communism away. So the film, the so film is available probably he left online. It. He, left, he left it all in Poland and he returned it devoid of any yes. communication with the Loas. Oh my goodness. That's, 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 that's how he frames that. Yeah, that's, that's a, quite of a beautiful story right there. And, uh, you know, those entanglements are more, more many, you know, I mean, as we go through the research, uh, we know that Polish national hero Tadeusz Kościuszko most likely went via Haiti when he was coming to America. His ship crashed around Saint-Domingue and he was saved by a miracle and eventually returned to, I mean, came, came to the States and that his Eight to the camp was was a character who followed him to to essentially Poland and uh, one of the one of the biographers of uh, Kościuszko writes about uh, uh, a gentleman whose name was Jean Lapierre who who was uh, called in Poland Dominique and Dominique uh, probably connects him to to the idea that he was from Saint Domingue and he served Kościuszko as his uh, very faithful aide during the time of the of his of his uh, fights with uh, Russia. So again, I think we're just touching maybe the tip of the icebergs of these narratives. I mean, there's another one that I'm working <laughs> on is the story of uh, Virkus. Uh, so Virkus is an American Marine Corps sergeant who ends up in the island of Lagunav, where he's crowned by the local population as a king of Lagunav. And Virkus is aware of the Polish uh, Haitian connections. He goes to Kazal, he meets people who still speak Polish at the time. So we're talking about 1915. Yeah, that was beautiful. That's a very peculiar story as well. And uh, Le Roi de Lagonave, that was the name, the title of his book, no? Right. Yeah, The White King of Lagonave. That's, that's the book. White King of Lagonave, yes. That is an, an, another amazing story. So you've, you've found ties with, uh, with uh, the Poles in, in that particular story because he went to Kazal or he, he claimed, so, he, I mean, did he go and... He, he did go to Kazal. So, so the story kind of goes back to the moment where he sent with the contingency of American Marines in 1915 during the occupation of Haiti. And he is essentially later on commissioned as a, as a lieutenant of the Guard de Haiti or Gendarmerie de Haiti. And uh, uh, he meets uh, a woman who is being essentially arrested by the Marines uh, for, for doing some kind of, for breaking some kind of law of the occupation. And the dialogue between him and the woman is uh, essentially kind of geared in a direction where he says, well, she didn't really do anything, let her go. And she says, what's your name? He says, my name is Francis, oh, Faustin Virkus. And she's like, you know, what is your name? He's like, Lieutenant Virkus. She says, no, no, I want the first one. And he says that his name is Faustin. So he lets the woman go. And then two or three years later, he 
ends up in La Gonave as an American, sort of a representative of American occupational forces. And the woman whom he saved is the queen of La Gonave. Her name is Tima Men, and she recognizes Virkus as essentially reincarnation of Faustin, the first emperor of Haiti. And she mm. crowns him as an oh emperor of Haiti. God. Lord Almighty. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a fascinating story as well. Um, I mean, Again, the pictures that are met, them, right? they, they, yeah, they're, they're amazing. And the photograph, I mean, I, I have used these photographs many times because they, they are very interesting of his uh, association, even marriage, you know, like, so that he becomes, you know, like uh, the white king of like, now to this Nenen, these voodoo priestess uh, out there. I mean, it's, uh, it's, there are entanglements and they, I mean, these are pretty interesting because I mean, Poland is so far uh, away from us and also is, uh, <clears throat> I mean, not really the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, I mean, cannot inscribe, I mean, I don't know. I mean, that, that's a question that I should ask you. I mean, does Poland inscribe itself as a colonial power? I mean, as a colonial, uh, uh, I mean, have they had the holdings anywhere else? I mean, not, not at all. No, I mean, so, so that narrative didn't exist that Poland had a colony abroad. I mean, that uh, that was not not part of the experience. But uh, again, the Virkus is uh, again this sort of emblematic dream of of you know a child who is an immigrant child comes from from Poland, works in uh, in Pennsylvania somewhere in a mining. Uh, uh, fields over there, and then he sort of perceives that joining the Marine Corps for him is the discover of the world, join Marines, see the world, and then going to the lavish tropic from from this uh, gray area of the of the coal mining industry. It's it's a, it's a kind of uh, different story for him. And then again, he is the first person who essentially he was forced to abdicate by the Congress. He returns to America in 1930s. And then he goes back to Haiti and makes the first film about uh, Haitian voodoo. He records this film and brings it back. His story is sensationalized. Did film? The, the, film, did the, the film, film in Haitian voodoo? He, he did he did movie and uh, yeah the movie you can still find it uh, in some archives so so again i'll be happy to share some of this yes i would love we, to see all of that how are we with no, time? It's very I think it's, do we do we have questions from anybody because we've been we've been having fun and talking about our kind of common interest but uh, yes do we have any questions do we have any questions coming from the audience Anyways, okay. it's a fascinating story, Jensen. Okay, I don't know if anything is coming in chat. Well, there's something in chat here, okay. I don't see anything popping here yet. Well, anyway, I think, Edward, uh, the conversation keeps going, and I think... Uh, uh, you just mentioned a couple of days ago, uh, you introduced me to another group of artists who work on another project uh, uh, with Kazal, and uh, there's another story to it. 50 years ago, there was a massacre in Kazal uh, inflicted on the community by, by Papa Dax. So do you want to talk a little bit about yes, that? Yes, that, 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 that is very, uh, I mean, that's the real narrative today concerning the, the, the Poles in Haiti. I mean, there was, uh, I don't know the exact uh, uh, reason for the retribution that, the, that Duvalier had against the community there. I didn't even know that it was, you know, like so well organized as a, as a descendants of Poles in Haiti, which is very interesting. I mean, but subsequently I found out that it was true that there is, you know, like this community and this group of young uh, scholars and, and artists have decided to uh, to investigate this at, at full length, and uh, they've presented a, a book. And right now, they are working on a second e edition of uh, of young photographers, you know, like revisiting that 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 history. I mean, for the common knowledge, you know, like e locally. So um, e the photographs are are by young. Uh, e it was like, a, I don't know if it's a commission that they've asked these photographers to go back to Kazal and to figure out the, that, I mean, what's the, 
what's left of that uh, historical uh, 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 givens, you know, like in, in the community or what it is. I mean, I, I, I should ask them again, but I thought you, they, they should know you and they should know of your interest in this particular uh, history. And uh, I've put you in contact with them. So I'm glad you've done that. And uh, hopefully we we'll can see this production of uh, young photographers, you know, like uh, sooner than later in Miami to see what that story is all about. So anyway, somebody's, uh, yes, yeah, somebody's asking, somebody asking questions in the, in the chat if any of the, of the Poles ended up in America. So, so there are several interesting stories of, uh, of the Polish legionaries and whatever happened to them and to the narratives kind of go in, in many different directions. So we have two officers who became pirates in the Caribbean. So I know it sounds almost, uh, almost like a fairy tale, but uh, uh, there was, uh, uh, there was uh, one of the officers who fought in the south of Haiti, who never really joined Haitian, Haitian rebellion, but he stayed on the side of Napoleon. And uh, his name is Ignacy Blamer, or he comes out of an Irish family that settled in Poland. And Blamer has actually connections to South Florida. So what the, what the story says that Blamer essentially evacuated troops from Jeremy and uh, uh, he was escaping with Polish and French soldiers and they're intercepted by British Corvette. And essentially he was positioned as a high Mason in his, in his own kind of right. And he negotiated release of the Polish soldiers whereas the French soldiers were essentially taken as the prisoners of war by British. And uh, then he moved to Cuba and he starts the piracy in the Caribbean fighting on a, on a side of the, of the Napoleon to harass the British Navy. <laughs> and uh, his ship crashed somewhere in the, in the Flo Florida uh, Straits. And he ends up uh, living here for, for a little bit and his crew was uh, proposing to him that he should start an idea of starting the Polish kingdom in Florida. But Blamer didn't really follow that idea, uh, took back uh, whatever was uh, left out of his uh, uh, crew and uh, moved back eventually to, to Europe and fought on the side of Napoleon, received Lige de Honneur and, and uh, was highly, highly uh, recognized general. Yeah. Interesting. A, a yeah. Polish Republic yes. in South Florida? Is that what we're talking right. about? Right, so, so that was the <laughs> story. Then there were two other, other officers um, who, who essentially uh, decided to, to kind of uh, uh, work as a, as, a, as a kind of privateers in the, in the Caribbean and eventually they went back to Poland. So the story, and when you, when you research archives or when anyone researches archives, realizes that officers did not stay in Haiti because of the of the idea of the honor code to the, the oath to the banner, oath to the, to the Republic of France, they felt that they needed to go back and fight. Well, 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 very lost. So, so syncretic aspect of the image, I think Carol is asking about that. So what is the Polish cutting and what is the Haitian African? So what changed and what didn't? So, so the image in Poland to essentially uh, if, um, and then again, I think it would be difficult to kind of do it now. I'll have to go back to the archive of images, but the image of Poland is always covered with skirts. So there are skirts made out of precious metals and stones, and those images are exchangeable. And depending on whatever historic time you're looking in the in a kind of Polish uh, sequence, there will be a different skirt. So what you see in Haiti, the colors are replicating the images that were printed as a as a sanctioned images by the monastery of Częstochowa and painted and replicated uh, as those that were in circulation in the 1700s. Also in the earlier period, this image is ubiquitous of the Polish military kind of strategy. So you would find Polish military suits of armor. So Polish King Jan III Sobieski who fights the Ottoman army in Vienna on his suit of armor displays the, the image of Virgin Mary of Częstochowa. Also during the siege of uh, Częstochowa during the invasion of the Swedish army, this image becomes very ubiquitous, ubiquitous in the kind of Polish military landscape. And one of the Polish king, John uh, Kazimir, he crowns the Virgin Mary as the queen of Poland. So this image plays a very kind of important role. So uh, the Polish image evolves beyond what we see in Haiti. So the Polish image that we see in a kind of Catholic ride, the 
skirts kept changing. There were new images added to it. Uh, the kind of connection to John Paul II is kind of uh, added to this image. Whereas the Haitian image stays somewhat more constant within the kind of position of what is, I think, originally introduced. Edward, I think can you speak the, more the, to the, the Haitian side? Yeah. Yeah, the chromolithographs, I mean, started arriving in the 20s and 30s, mm -hmm. in the colored, the colored chromolithographs. And these were adopted. So they, I mean, there must be somewhere in either in Poland or somewhere else, I mean, producing images, these Catholic images, you know, like just for the sake of Haiti. I don't know. I don't think they've ever been produced, you know, like or mass marketed uh, chromolithographs stemming from Haiti. They were always imported. And uh, when I was a kid, I mean, there was like a brief sale of those on the streets of Fort Prince, you know, like, and they framed them and they, and um, I don't know, I mean, the, the oldest image is used in Haiti. I mean, it's, uh, it would be very difficult to, but we can assume that that particular image that we have behind you there is, uh, is uh, from the 30s, you know, like 20s, 30s. I mean, chromolithographs that started landing in Haiti at that time. And all of these gods, you know, like were, you know, like the adopted because, I mean, the, the syncretism happened when these images started proliferating in Haiti. St. Peter, as I mean, St. Jacques, I mean, you know, like uh, St. James, you know, like the, the I mean, the, the, the one riding the horse. I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a good group of 12 of them that are, you know, like being still sold in, you know, like just to put the, as votive uh, uh, images for your home or, or whatever. So, and um, you, they, you, see, you see them constantly in voodoo temples and things like that. But I mean, I, I, I mean, as you say, the change, it's changed in Europe, but in Haiti, it's pretty constant. Right. We have another question, I think, that comes here from, uh, uh, was Grotowski visited Kazal? So, so Grotowski, his last trip over there kind of coincides with kind of late 70s. So when he brings Amon Fremont to Poland from on his over there until 1981, because the martial law imposed by Jaruzelski essentially catches him over there in Haiti and he kind of returns. So, so most likely, yes, that's... Uh, and, and I think, again, you know, Grotowski's interest in Africa, I think it's, a, it's another, another conversation, long story. And uh, there is a professor in uh, one of the f universities in Florida who actually specializes on Grotowski's entanglements with Haiti. So like, that's another conversation we should have. So I think we may have time for one more question. And if there is none, again, I would like to thank Edward for, for graciously agreeing to, to come over to this, uh, to this conversation of my sort of uh, research obsession on Polish Haitian entanglements. And yes. again, the green It always amuses me when, when I speak with you concerning this, because you're very taken by that particular story. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to, to do some research in Haiti itself one day. And I would like to hear well, about that. I've been to Haiti several times, but my last trip obviously was postponed by, I mean, I was supposed to go over there for the 50th, uh, for the 50th anniversary of the, of the, of the Kazal, um, again, a massacre was yes, done by Papa Dac, and then uh, that trip was essentially canceled. But uh, uh, I'm working on, on this exhibition on uh, Virkus's kingdom, kingdom of Lagunav that will open soon in Poland. But uh, if anybody's interested in, in the archive, archive is displayed now at the, at the library at the university on MMC campus. So you can see some of the examples of uh, different Virgin Marys and Erzulis uh, that were produced here in, in Miami. and. Uh, some, some of the archival pieces that really represent a lot of things that uh, really bring that narrative closer to home. And uh, please, please join us and see it. And again, thank you. Them. Thank you again for, for allowing us to, to really spend some few moments with the community and talk about this important Polish Atlantic history. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.